Welcome to the seminar of the History and Games Lab. It is the first uh, seminar of our second, uh, our second semester, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, uh, Robert Houghton uh, has joined us uh, our program. Um, Robert is uh, a medievalist from uh, the University of Winchester, but uh, his uh, interests and expertise include uh, the Middle Ages in modern media, uh, and especially uh, games and, uh, and, uh, and, and video games, uh, in which he has uh, uh, plenty of, of experience. And that is uh, the topic of tonight's uh, um, seminar, uh, which focuses especially on uh, Sid Meier's uh, civilization. Uh, so our um, seminar tonight is entitled More Than uh, Sid Meier's Civilization, Breaking Genres uh, for Better Histories. And uh, it's very personal for me, um, this topic, because I think uh, playing civilization when I was an undergrad undergraduate delayed my uh, graduation uh, for several months. Um, I graduated in Italy where you, it was, uh, the system was a bit more flexible. So um, even if I haven't played uh, civilization, the, the, the last uh, couple of civilization probably, but you know, I. It feels personal because of that reason, because I, I played that game quite a lot in my in my youth. Um, so the the paper will last uh, um, what uh, half, half an hour more or less, uh, Rob, and then there will be the opportunity to ask uh, to ask question. Now we are recording this uh, seminar uh, just to, so you are aware when you ask questions that uh, um, they they will be included in the re in the recording. Uh, but without further ado, uh, Robert. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Luca. I suppose both them, um, yes, first of all, and thank you for reorganising this event so it didn't, didn't coincide with the industrial action currently going on at the University of Edinburgh. I should possibly also highlight I'm technically not here in my capacity as a lecturer at the University of Winchester. Um, this, is, this is being done on my own time. We're working beyond hours and so forth. I won't go on too long about the industrial dispute, but if you're interested, I would strongly urge you to consider visiting University College Union websites and catching up on everything there. On to the main event though. Today I'm talking about Sid Meier's, Sid Meier's civilization and I'm talking about how we can change, how we can use the game for, for teaching purposes, how it's very useful for looking at the past but also looking at the restrictions around it. And as Lucas indicated, the Civilization series of strategy games and its portrayal of historical and contemporary rule and rulership is vast and influential. The core games opening with the original Civilization back in 1991, I suspect this might have been the game that did, well, almost derailed Lucas' academic career, it almost, certainly almost derailed mine. These games place the player in the role of a near omniscient and immortal ruler overseeing their chosen people over the course of around 6,000 years of history and challenge them to build a civilization that will stand the test of time. The longevity of the series and its sub substantial commercial success underlines its impact on a massive and growing audience and on the popular consciousness in general. And despite the increasing complexity and variety of the series, the games remain reasonably accessible, with the genre contributing to its commercial success and demonstrable impact on their audience's perception of history. This commercial success and influence have pro has prompted an academic focus on civilized civilization games for their representation of rulership and other historical processes, and for their consequential educational potential. Indeed, the games have almost certainly received more scholarly attention than any other series within the strategy genre. The series has been applauded for its ability to communicate historical theories through game mechanics and gameplay, but it's been chastised for the content of these theories and the tendency towards Eurocentrism, imperialism, and colonialism, and a vision of history as inevitable and irreversible progress. Perhaps most significantly, the series has often been presented as the paragon example of a conceptual simulation. These are games that are described by Adam Chapman as games which portray history primarily through their mechanics in juxtaposition to realist simulations, which portray history instead through their audiovisual elements, games like Assassin's Creed or Medal of Honor. While realist simulations can exert a substantial influence on their players' interest in history and may serve as useful as useful introduction to events, periods, or regions, conceptual simulations have greater capacity to engage with historical systems and arguments, 
and are increasingly recognised as more potent tools for higher level study or even for academic research. However, while the focus of so much scholarship on civilization is entirely understandable, this overwhelming focus on a single source and its approach has undermined the development of pedagogical and scholarly thought around games within the genre. As Chapman has emphasized, even within the same genre and with the same source material, different games can provide very different historical narratives. However, pedagogical use of strategy games has tended to look to civilization and how to mitigate its shortcomings, or else how to make a constructive and critical use of these issues, while scholarly criticism has tended to class games of this genre in the shadow of civilization. This has left a substantial gap with within the period and a tendency to overlook different ludic representations and the potential as teaching or research tools. Most basically, this has led to a rather flat consideration of the ways in which games may influence their players' understanding of history in general, and rulership in particular. An issue of particular importance given we have emerging evidence that games outside of the civilization franchise, and most notably games such as Crusader Kings and Europa Universalis, there's growing evidence that these different games within the genre have a more pronounced impact on their players' understanding of history. The impact of this singular scholarly focus on civilization is clearly visible when considering rulership within the medieval period. The Middle Ages received very little attention within the civilization games. The chart I've brought up here, this is the original tech tree from the original civilization. You can see I've highlighted the two technologies which represent the entirety of the Middle Ages, mainly feudalism, which does nothing except the lead on to chivalry, which allows access to a slightly more powerful version of the, of the, of the chariot. Quite pointedly, this is a technological dead end. Plenty to be said about that. Nevertheless, the timescale within civilization games to this day is substantially compressed, such that the significant majority of the game is played after 1500. Most victory conditions, in fact, can only be completed after the medieval end of the Middle Ages. And the core mechanics of the game are very much built around conceptions of modern, and in particular, American society. The Middle Ages are often an afterthought within civilization, and many of the limitations of the social and political models presented through the game's mechanics are more ac acutely visible within this pre modern period. There's also an increasing evidence that historical games influence their audiences, influence their audiences more strongly with regards to the Middle Ages than later periods. As a combination of these factors, this demands the reconsideration of not only how medieval rulership is represented within civilization, but other potentially, yeah, but how other potentially more influential games engage with the subject. It must be emphasized, before I go too far into this vein, it must be emphasized that historical work exists which addresses strategy games outside the civilization series or even the representation of political and social history through other genres of game. Kuebel has produced a detailed and well-considered comparative analysis between civilization and the historical strategy games produced by Paradox Interactive, most particularly Crusader Kings and Europa Universalis. Cavallo's consideration of the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is a particularly strong example of a, a, a consideration of, of games outside the strategy genre. In this case, the Wild Hunt of Witcher 3 emphasizes the use of limited knowledge and personal connections with the characters to build a perspective of pseudo-medieval rulership from a very different perspective from that of civilization. However, these examples of scholarship are very much in the minority. The focus of the vast majority of work within this subfield remains firmly on civilization. This paper then addresses the ways in which games beyond civilization franchise and beyond the strategy genre as a whole, the ways these games engage with rulership during the Middle Ages. The issue is not so much that civilization presents a limited or outdated view of the subject matter, although this is undoubtedly the case to some degree. 
rather the overwhelming focus of research into this one game limits our understanding of the ways in which computer games may address this historical theme, how this may influence players' understanding of the issue, and how games may be used in and research. To this end, I'm going to first of all reiterate several of the key characteristics of rulership within the civilization series as identified within early, earlier literature. I'm then going to go on to use a case of three studies to explore alternative approaches through the incorporation of role playing elements within Crusader Kings 3, through the abstraction and brevity of a casual game like Brains, and through the evolution of a first person combat game, namely Mountain Brain Warband. These examples are representative of a growing range of games which approach the issue of medieval rulership through mechanics and gameplay which are fundamentally different from those of civilization, and which, as a consequence, present significantly different accounts of the period, and often avoid, alleviate, or resolve the issues within civilization. Ultimately, I'm going to argue that while the civilization games provide an influential and valuable approach to history, there is substantial pedagogical and scholarly benefit to the adoption and consideration of mechanics and approaches drawn from different games and genres. Once account is far from encyclopedic, and each of these approaches must be considered through a suitably critical eye, considering a broader range of games allows for more effective teaching and a deeper consideration of medieval rulership in the Middle Ages more broadly, and history in general through games. So, First of all, then, I want to talk about rulership within civilization. So the historical approaches to rulership presented through the mechanics and gameplay of the civilization series have been dissected and debated to a substantial degree by numerous authors and by a number of relevant and a number of relevant historical trends have emerged. Most significantly, a number of authors have identified that civilization and its various spin-offs provide the player with a degree of omniscience and omnipotence have identified the stagnancy of polities, rulers, and objectives. They've also identified an emphasis on conquest, imperialism, and colonialism, and they've highlighted a disconnect between mechanics and the historical theme. The games of the Civilization series provide their players with an, an immense wealth of knowledge and control over their simulated worlds and people. The player can see almost everything that happens within their borders and command absolute obedience from their various units, cities, diplomats, and scientists. The game's technology tree and encyclopedia, civil opinion rather, grant players full knowledge of the scientific, technological, and cultural changes which will occur over the course of the game and the consequences that these changes may have for the civilization and for their neighbors. While the game mechanics allow the player to dictate how and when these changes will occur. In later games in the series, from Civilization IV onwards, players may go as so, so far as to create their own religions and even dictate their own doctrine. The Civilization series also prevents, presents substantial continuity of ruler and political identity sense of continuity of the goals of these rulers and the manner of rulership exerted by each of the figures which rule over the given civilization. The games in the series present their civilizations as unchanging historical actors throughout their 6,000 year time span. And as a consequence, these games present a vision of history with a heavy emphasis on the role of the immutable nation state. These states are effectively mono-ethnic through their, throughout their history, and the unique traits and abilities of each faction remain static throughout the day. Players focus on the completion of long-term victory conditions, which are typically only achievable towards the end of the time frame. These mechanics reward long-term planning, often, often extending to the pre-game selection of, of a faction and to a detailed and extensive discussion outside the game. Even the core mechanics remain the same throughout the game. Warfare, diplomacy, and economics use the same fundamental mechanics from the Stone Age right the way through to the Space Age. The player simply gains access to more effective means of exploiting these mechanics. In effect, a pharaoh plays much the same way as a medieval king or a modern president. Conquest.
imperial and colonialism are presented as near universal is driven by game mechanics and by player expectation. Conquest is encouraged through the reward of a higher score for aggressive expansion than for peaceful coexistence. Through easy access to resources, through war and for peace, and through the core victory conditions, and indeed in earlier iterations of the game, through the difficulty of achieving other types of victory, types of victory other than conquest at higher levels of play. The games present an image of history where every faction strives to expand game resources, typically through violence, and hence promotes the perception that the imperialism and colonialism which accompanied these conflicts were not only inevitable and a necessity for progress, but also that this approach was universal among all cultures. While the disconnection between gameplay and historical consequence is clearest around warfare, imperialism, and colonialism, this divide, this neo narrative disconnect, is visible throughout the game's representation of history. Civilization forces the player to learn the game's mechanics in order to win. And when these mechanics presented and understood in the historical, of the historical process. However, the game's mechanics separate players from their actions. Players do not act as individuals, but rather as totemic, totemic and immortal forces. As such, many players, particularly at the higher difficulty levels, focus their play on producing optimal strategies, including the infinite city scroll displayed here, rather than considering the implication of their actions beyond these abstract mechanics. The games can act as informative representations of history, but this relies on critical play and is undermined by the division between mechanics and real. As for Hughes has argued, player civilization often amounts to the solution of an abstract puzzle rather than an investigation of history. These tendencies are obviously at odds with most cons modern considerations of historical rulership in general and the medieval rulership in particular. But the more pertinent issue is that the scholarly, scholarly focus on civilization has led to the casual assumption in many cases that this representation is the dominant, if not the only way in which games may interact engage with this historical theme. This is patently not the case. The precise drivers behind these design decisions are nuanced and combine audience and developer perspectives of historical processes with the mechanical requirements of the series and genre. But these drivers are also skewed by the legacy of the original civilization and its adoption of the contemporary 1991 worldview. Different games produced at different times in different genres by different development teams inevitably produce different accounts. And the first of these accounts I'd like to look at today is produced through Crusader Kings 3. Crusader Kings 3 is one of the latest in the broad ranging series of historical strategy games produced by Paradox Interactive. It's an important example of a game within the same genre as Civilization, which nevertheless presents rulership in a fundamentally different manner. Historical representations within Crusader Kings have been subject to a handful of historical, well, a handful of studies, although considerably fewer than Civilization. The games are superficially similar in that they both place the player in the role of a ruler and their gameplay focus on, focuses on rulership for a complex series of mechanics. However, there are a number of easily visible distinctions. Crusader Kings covers a shorter time span, it is set across a large part of Afro Eurasia rather than the entirety of a randomly generated world. The game lacks defined objectives. And the mechanics of Crusader Kings are considerably more complex, varied, and often opaque than those of civilization. These factors dictate that the representation of the Middle Ages within Crusader Kings is substantially different and in some ways deeper than that of civilization. Most significantly, though, the gameplay of Crusader Kings 3 focuses on relationships, whether through family, friendship, or vassalage, and through role playing varied and changeable individuals and personalities. The player takes control of a succession of individuals comprising the medieval dynasty amongst a vast range of active characters at several levels of a rudimentary feudal pyramid. 
each of these figures is presented as a complex combination of a significant, sorry, of a significant range of traits, including being chaste, arrogant, or just. All of these traits influence how effective each character is at a given task, ranging from military leadership to theological debate. These traits also influence the behavior of computer-controlled actors. Characters who possess the contempt trait will typically do little beyond maintaining the status quo, while ambitious characters will often plan to expand their holdings or gain higher social rank. The continued existence of this complex, multi-tiered model of society is ensured through severe restrictions on the amount of territory which any one character may control effectively. All but the smallest of qualities must be comprised of the web of land holding characters in order to function even remotely effectively. Players are embedded within this complex system of personal relationships, and the developers got, have gone to substantial lengths to encourage their players to role play as their characters. Detailed and engaging events triggered by particular actions circumstances and character traits create an emergent narrative which ties more closely to the individual life fortunes of the game's cast. A simple experience system allows characters to unlock new abilities within any of five broad life styles, but characters gain traits considerably more swiftly within the area in which they were educated, encouraging players to follow the character's expertise to gain greater benefits. Conversely, a punitive system of stress mechanics penalise those who act out of character. An honest character initiate, initiating a murderous plot, for example, will, will, be, you know, will suffer from stress and various consequences for their out-of-character actions. This system of stress provides a soft limit to player actions and further encourages behaviour which matches character traits. In combination with the open-ended gameplay, lack of overarching objectives, and the availability of a substantial range of different approaches, this drives players towards a different play style for each character and has demonstrably encouraged roleplay within the game's community. The focus on personal relationships limits the player's power substantially. Character is reliant to a substantial vassals may withhold military and financial support from their lords, or even plot to rebel and overthrow their erstwhile masters. Family members demand attention and management to avoid potential disaster in subsequent generations. Rival noble households may engage in huge threat and instability of the realm or create alliances amongst themselves which threaten to overshadow the power of their king. The player's character exists within this complex web of relationships and will often find their ability to act decisively restricted. The emphasis on personalities, relationships and role play also limits the continuity of rule, rulership and objectives across the time span of Crusader Kings. The different abilities of succession of characters under player control dictate that the effectiveness of different strategies will vary across the course of the game. A potent warrior may be followed by an expert diplomat with no martial prowess, which will necessitate a fundamental change in, in play in order to be effective. Control of polities and territory is an important element of gameplay within Crusader Kings, but it is entirely possible for a dynasty to gain and lose control of several feudal titles over the course of the game. And in any event, the benefits of controlling a vast empire are often marginal and tempered by the larger system of vassalage required to govern such territory. The emphasis on role play and interpersonal relationships also provides a stronger connection between the mechanical outcomes of a player's actions and their historical meaning. In contrast with the impersonal engagements of civilization, diplomatic, social, military, and other interactions within Crusader Kings III are conducted between visually distinct characters and are driven by a logic which is based more on personalities and social concerns than it is on the ceaseless acquisition of power in order to fulfill objectives. 
propose encouraging behaviours to these constituents, a place that emphasises a consideration of the personal consequences of actions and the engagement of the plague with kinds of concerns of not only their own kids, but also many of those with who are at play through their emphasis on personal relationships and the use of their So Crusader King's Free then presents a very different view of the Middle Ages and of medieval rulership in comparison to that of civilization. The next game I'd like to talk about is Reigns, which is a very different genre of game, falling very we class most easily as a casual game. And in stark contrast with the detail and depth of Crusader King's Free, Reigns is an abstract and simple ludic representation of medieval rulership, which avoids use of detailed maps, statistics, or rules. The player takes on the role of a series of kings or queens in Reigns 2 within an unnamed medieval realm with a strong Western European influence. Unlike the grand objectives of civilization or the open sandbox of Crusader Kings, the basic goal within Reigns is simply to rule for as long as possible by avoiding being overthrown with a typical reign amounting to a few minutes of playtime. Each turn, representing a year, a binary decision is presented to the player in the form of a request from a member of the royal court. For example, the player may be asked to choose whether to go to war, to get married, or whether to support the peasants after a famine. These decisions are drawn initially from a relatively small deck, but this expands over the course of the game as new characters are introduced. A small number of these decisions may have long-term consequences, introducing new decisions, progressing the overarching plot of the game, or embarking on a handful of building, military, and economic projects, ranging from the construction of a communal barn to launching a crusade. The majority of these decisions, though, simply adjust one or more of four ratings. You can see the icon on the top of the screen there. One or more of four ratings, which reflect the power and support of different groups within the kingdom, the church, the people, and the military, and also the wealth of the kingdom. And supporting the peasants after a famine will boost their power within the, completely within the kingdom while depleting the treasury, while refusing to help peasants has the opposite effect. Beyond this, some of the aforementioned projects raise or lower specific ratings every second, so going on crusade boosts income but while penalising the peasants. The approximate impact of each decision, alongside a rough indication of the current prominence of each group, is presented to the player, but exact values are withheld under most circumstances. In order to retain the throne and hence complete the basic objective of the game, the player must balance these factions through careful reaction to each decision and prevent any of them from becoming too powerful by reaching a rating of 100 or too, un or too unhappy by reaching a rating of zero. If any group reaches the end of the scale in either direction, the current king will be overthrown by that faction, and play will continue with the king's successor, with each of the four ratings reset to a balanced 50. The simple mechanics present a very different account of medieval rulership from that of the all-powerful and all-knowing rulers of civilization. The player is reactive and only given a choice of two options in any given situation. They can only address the issues presented to them and they can only influence their kingdom through the binary outcome of these decisions. The player's position is precarious. Rather than being the unquestioned ruler of their kingdom, their throne is always at risk from the various factions within and outside their borders. And these decisions are made with limited information. The player seldom has precise knowledge of their political situation or the impact of any of their choices. This presents the player in combination with the precarity of their position and leads to a very different and more cautious play style than is typical within civilization or crusader kings. Reigns presents kings as possessing very limited power and being reliant on careful manipulation of relationship networks in order to retain their position. The precarity and short-term focus of these kings also stands in stark contrast with the long-term objectives and polit political entities which exist within civilization. Each reign has relatively little impact on the next as the balance of power within the kingdom is reset after each ruler is overthrown. Few elements which carry over from one king to the next, so building a barn will prevent the king from being overthrown if the peasant rating ever drops to zero. These buildings can be advantageous to future rulers and these advantages may influence players to take these opportunities even at the expense of their current rule. 
but the impact of these longer term factors is relatively limited and certainly much less pronounced than that which accompanies the totemic rulers of civilization. As the player is focused on maintaining, maintaining control of their kingdom for as long as possible, there is relatively little continuity between rulers. The game presents medieval kings as focused very strongly on short-term planning and reacting to crises, although it does highlight the influence of longer-term issues on the decisions made by these rulers. Focus on the short term alongside a, a, lack of a, substantive, sorry, a lack of substantive change over the course of the game also means that Reigns avoids the history as progress motive, motif of civilization. Instead, the Middle Ages is presented as technologically and culturally stagnant. Although new decisions and characters are unlocked over the course of the game, there's a limited pattern and no fixed time scale to these emergencies. The gameplay remains static across the entire period. In fact, the overarching plot of the game concerns breaking free of the medieval cycle through a renaissance or enlightenment. Taken as a whole, Reigns sidesteps the wickish traditions common to civilization, although this presentation of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages conforms to different outdated historical traditions. And finally, the game Reigns is abstract mechanics, and in particular, the lack of a map also limit the impact and importance of warfare and conquest within Reigns. Military activity is a part of the game, and is, is, is reflected by the presence of military metric, and also the presence of several cards around the themes of war, raids, and even crusades, as we can see here. However, as is the case in Crusader Kings, there are substantial differences between the purpose and importance of warfare within civilization in comparison to raids. The lack of a map dictates that any conquest within raids are abstract. There is no territory to be conquered and no, no long-term benefit to engaging in conquest. Further, the decision cards associated with warfare function identically to those relating to any other element of rulership. Warfare is simply one and an almost fungible element of kingship relevant within the game. Likewise, while various cards allow the player to launch a crusade, to establish a colony, or engage in the slave trade, each of these activities is presented in a negative light through the in-game text and through mechanical terms. The representative status effects raising or lowering one, of, one or more of the four kingdom ratings every second, and in doing so, drawing the kingdom ever closer to disaster. I'm aware of the time, but fortunately this is my smallest example. So to wrap us up here, I finally want to talk about first-person rulership in Mountain Blade. So the core mechanics in Mountain Blade are very different from civilization. They revolve around giving a small band of troops from a first-person perspective for a series of battles in a pseudo-medieval world. But the game has also come to incorporate strategic movement of forces on a world map, Various other activities, including the acquisition of territorial holdings incorporated into a basic feudal system, and ultimately the game allows its players to rule over such a kingdom. As such, while Mountain Blade is a game primarily about conflict and warfare, it addresses many of the same historical systems as civilization, albeit for a vastly different genre. And this has a number of consequences. Civilization takes a top-down view, while Mountain Blade is firmly grounded in its first-person perspective. Within Mountain Blade, the player acts as an individual character, and although several trends, key trends remain constant between Civilization and Mountain Blade, this core difference in approach influences Mountain Blade's representation of history in several ways. Perhaps most centrally, Mountain Blade substantially limits the amount of information available to the player. The vision is restricted by fog of war, a mechanic common within strategy games. But in the case of Mountain Blade, the visible area is restricted to that immediately around the player themselves. They are unable to see anything surrounding their allies, as is more typical within games of this nature. Knowledge of the world is therefore restricted to what player is physically able to see. And this curtailment influences player behavior and presents medieval rulership as itinerant by, nece by necessity. The player simply has to move around to know what's happening within their kingdom. Mountain Blade also limits the player's control over the world to a much greater degree than civilization. The player may only directly influence events at which they are present. So to command forces in a battle, the player must be there on the battlefield. 
communication with other characters is typically conducted in person, which requires meeting the character somewhere on the strategy map and indeed finding them in the first place. Recruitment and up and maintaining buildings requires the presence of the character. And once the character has become king, their vassals pursue their own objectives and often react slowly to royal orders, occasionally ignoring them entirely. Vassals may also defect to other factions if their relationship with the player deteriorates sufficiently, presenting the role of the king as one of careful maintenance of political balances rather than absolute rulers of civilization. And this focus, on a, uh, yeah, this focus on a single character allows Mountain Blade to neatly sidestep the presentation of continuity of ruler and polity over centuries or millennia as present in civilization. There's no time limit to the game, but the implication is that the play takes place within one lifetime and gameplay is unlikely to exceed 20 years. The difficulties surrounding continuity of rule and objectives are avoided by Mountain Blade as the player embodies a single mortal character rather than an unchanging immortal abstract. So, to wrap things up then, this analysis highlights the different approaches to med medieval rulership present within computer games and underlines the fact that while civilization is important and influential, it's not the only viable approach to this issue. The incorporation of different mechanics allow, um, allows the construction of very different accounts of history for players to explore. These differences may comprise more detailed or more nuanced variations of core systems common to strategy games, but they may also include the incorporation of mechanics more typically associated with the other genres, such as the role play within Crusader games. Approaches to rulership within games of other genres, including those visible within Reigns or Mountain Blade, can likewise produce a substantively different vision of the same beat. This is not to say that these approaches are superior to those of civilization or that they resolve all of the issues encountered within that series. Crusader Kings grants even more data than civilization and ties in very strongly to a great man approach. Reigns presents rulers who are functionally identical and is easily reduced to an exercise in puzzle solving and risk taking. Mountain Blade is also fundamentally a game about warfare which revolves around the conquest of the world in effect. These issues may be resolved through user modification or critical play, but still form central elements of the games in question. Nevertheless, these varied approaches and consequent representations demand that pedagogical and scholarly consideration of rulership and rule within computer games continue to move beyond civilization and beyond the strategy genre more generally. Civilization games influence their players' comprehension of history and have a substantial impact on the design of historical games. They can be considerable, of considerable value in the classroom and are certainly worthy of study. I'm not for a second saying we should stop looking at civilization at all. However, these factors are true of an expanding range of computer games, many of which make use of fundamentally different mechanics to create distinct and more in well, and interesting theme images of the theme. Placing such examples, sorry, placing such an emphasis on civilization ignores this diversity and limits the field of study. As such, it's important to emphasize that while the games I've discussed here are particularly pertinent examples, they're simply representative of a much broader range of ludic approaches to rulership in the Middle Ages. See, for example, in At the Gates, flips the usual perspective of inevitable and continuous imperialist expansion to explore history from outside the perspective of the civilized world. As far as the eye takes, a, an, an, era, takes an approach which addresses nomadic lifestyles and presents a, well, yeah, presents a very different view of rulership of society indeed from that presented within civilization. A substantial range of role-playing games from Pathfinder through Neverwinter Nights onto Pillars of Eternity have incorporated interesting narrative and mechanics around rulership within pseudo-medieval worlds, and games like Expeditions Viking use their role-playing mechanics as a basis for a surprisingly deep engagement with issues of medieval politics and rule. More experimental approaches such as For the Universo, which removes the map and other key elements to present a very bare bones vision of historical mechanics and likewise yes your grace which combines the system of choices presented within reigns with role play and strategy elements 
all of these games explore kinship in a very different manner from typical strategy games. It's also important to emphasize that rulership in the Western Middle Ages is far from the only historical theme of the region or period whose scholarship and pedagogy is undermined by the dominance of civilization. The series representation of rulership is a poor fit for the ancient world and for large parts of the modern world. Likewise, despite growing representation within civilization, the series depiction of global history follows a fundamentally Western paradigm which undermines its utility in consideration, in, in consideration of political and social history outside of Western Europe or of North America. The series presentation of other historical issues ranging from science and technology through to demographic and climate change represents a single and often very limited perspective. More broadly, this analysis highlights the limitations of genre and other categorization of historical games. Each of the games discussed here addresses rulership, but each does, through, does so through the use of systems typically associated with different genres. The games don't fit, also, the games don't really fit very neatly with Chapman's realist conceptual dichotomy, and I'll be happy to talk about that in more depth. Yeah, I'll be, be happy to talk about that in more depth um, in the questions after this. Basically, these systems of genre and Chapman's dichotomy, they're incredibly useful. They're a, necessity they're a necessary method of categorizing games, but they must be seen as flexible tools rather than absolute definitions. Ultimately then, Civilization is and will remain a hugely influential series within the industry, classroom and academy, and will likewise remain a focus for historical teaching and scholarship. I've got no doubt about any of that statement. However, as I've illustrated here, Myriad different games deploy diverse mechanics to provide distinct representations of history, including, but not limited to, medieval rulership. The study of these games can only support our understanding of the ways in which games may represent history and how these representations may be deployed for pedagogical and research purposes. It may not be time to abandon civilization, but it's increasingly necessary to look beyond its coming. Maybe we need to look at more than just Sydney as civilization. Thank you all very much. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I've, I've abused my time. Sorry, my apologies for that. No, no, it's just, uh, well, it was a very interesting topic, so it was great to hear more about it. Um, let's open the floor to questions. Um, please un unmute yourself or uh, write the question in the, um, in the chat, and I will read it for you. Um, so if you have a question, please ask it now. Gordon? Rob, yep. uh, Rob, I noticed in the Crusader Kings 3, there was still two, three choices. What actually limits the number of choices that's available to the player? Uh, I mean, I, I know it would be boring to go through yeah. a reading through a list of 20 subtle variations, but... Uh, is it still to do with computer power? Uh, yeah, right. So, yeah, so I think you're talking about the various pop-up events you get in Crusader Kings yeah. 3. You're yeah. absolutely right. Typically, you're limited to two, three, maybe at most four different options. Um, there's various reasons why the developers have gone down that route. Partly, it's down to more complexity. It's down to the difficulty in pro or putting all of this together. So for every option that you provide, you've got to write it up, you've got to figure out how it's going to balance and so forth. What I would say is with a lot of these events within Crusader Kings 3, a lot of your options are driven at least in part by the personality of the character that you're playing as. So if you're, I'm trying to think of an example now, so yeah, if you're involved in a plot to murder one of your rivals, for example, um, if you've also got... If you've got one of these, yeah, we've got one of the many different character traits which improve your relationships with members of other, another religion. You might find a secret society who will come and offer to help you out there in exchange for a donation or what have you. And a lot of these events get ridiculously complex pretty quickly. So there's numerous branches coming out of this. You're absolutely right. You're only getting three options for each decision, but quite often that will lead to another set of three choices and onto another set. 
In Crusader Kings, this is also coupled with the more traditional civilization style approach, where you've still got this vast array of choices that you're able to make over the rulership of your kingdom. It's just this narrative element, this role play element attached to it. It's far from ideal. I'd really love to see Crusader Kings or games like it going down the traditional pen and paper role playing method. So you've got a dungeon master sat somewhere behind the scenes. Yeah. You can come up with what will appropriate reactions, appropriate consequences to everything that you do. Regrettably, though, that's not remotely practical. So we're stuck with this, well, this old school role, um, digital role playing game system akin to anything from Baldur's Gate. We just have two or three options because that's all the story they could fit in. Mm. And so I appreciate I'm droning on here, but yeah, I find that this distinct from Reigns because a lot of the time you're, as the player is the one driving which decisions they're going to be offered. Yeah. Reigns, you're just presented with something to deal with each turn. You're pretty much purely reactive right the way through the game, whereas with Crusader Kings, yes, you're reactive to an extent, but you're much more active, much more proactive in many other elements. Thanks. I enjoyed Reigns for a while. Um, there was a little bit too much uh, mystical and ghost stuff in, in it, uh, taking you down alleyways that uh, I never quite got. Uh, uh. You know, it's um, I suppose this is one of the one of the issues with a lot of a lot of medievalist games and a lot of pseudo medieval worlds. So I very much take your point. There are plenty of aspects of what talking skeletons, this whole the whole overarching plot, which I won't spoil for anyone who somehow avoided rains. I mean, I've got all the supernatural figures, ecclesiology, well, um, yeah, ecclesiology and so forth. Um, I think it's still useful to an extent for representing or for considering the Middle Ages. And to be fair, I'd say the literature is useful for well, for different reasons. But yeah, I, I very much take your point. If you're looking for something that's got a, a very, very straight historical perspective, Reigns is entertaining, but it's not for you. Thank you. We have a question by Paul. Uh, hi. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, um, towards the end of the talk that um, about how games like civilizations of the grand strategy historical narrative uh, have a um as often a very western folk western centric focus and in terms of historical strategy games i mean for example shogun 2 total war would you i mean i, I would argue the game developers have to reconcile cult cultural and historical authenticity with also selling the game to a predominantly Western audience, because there's what there's what samurai will really like, and then there's what the Western audience thinks of when they when they somebody says samurai. Is there a way forward to uh, reconciling the two uh, in a more in a in a better way? Um, that yeah. was that was sorry that, that was that was that was a series of very well put explanations which I completely agreed with. Followed by followed by a, a very tricky question, which I'll I'll endeavour to, to address. You're absolutely right. First of all, um, yeah, the the majority of games. It remains the case. The majority of games are produced within the Western world. That's shifting quite fundamentally now. So there's a growing market in well, Brazil, for example. Nigeria is another outgrowth, and so and of course China, Japan, all of these different countries. Uh, to get their own gaming communities and their own game development games companies based in the United States, Europe, and to a certain extent over in Japan. And you're absolutely right. They're producing for a Western audience, even companies which aren't based. And this is, as I say, this is a key factor, a key reason for why these games produce this Western perspective. I think we're getting to the point, though, where there's certainly appetite for more, well, more, more authentic, more, more accurate, even approaches to, well, to history in general, and in particular to non-Western history. There is a demonstrable interest in games set outside of Europe, set outside of the Western world as a whole. 
there's a demonstrable interest in a great range of other cultures. And I think this was illustrated quite neatly within the recent, or I say recent, it's about a decade old now, Shogun 2 Total War, with the, the notorious healing balloons behind samurai. It's something that made no sense to a large Western audience. It's something that was complained about on the forums, but the pushback was immediate. This is something, this was how the outfits looked. And the game was still a massive success. So I appreciate this is very much a baby step. This is getting an outfit correct. But it's indicative of, I think, or I hope, a broader trend towards not just interest in places beyond the Western world, because you've seen this within civilization, growing range of civilizations from beyond the West, but an interest in different perspectives. So I think there is a growing market, or there is a demonstrable market, I think it's a growing market for games which go beyond this. And once you've got a growing market, once the market's there, there's potential to start getting more, well, first of all, getting representatives of these groups, experts in these areas, getting them involved in development, getting them involved in development studios. And a growing range of development studios are looking for advisors and looking for consultants in these areas. Often these are the smaller studios and often they're a little bit restricted in what they're able to commit to or what they're willing to commit to. But it's movement in the right direction. Beyond that, it's just a matter of perhaps teaching everyone, teaching as many people who will listen to be a bit more critical of the games that they're playing. Not necessarily every game, you don't have to be dissecting, I don't, you don't have to be dissecting work at all. But if you're playing a historical game, if you're interested in history, is looking at it beyond this is a representation of it to for what's this how do we get this vision of the apologies the audio is not the best tonight the connection is not the best um i think it's frozen now it's a bit rambling but i did warn you as a, as a, no, I think I think it's a, there is a connection. Sometimes um, is breaking up. Um, but thank you, thank you for the question and for the answer. I see that uh, Glare has a question. Let's raise that. Hand. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for um, for the really interesting talk. And just to follow up on on what you just said in response to Paul's comment, it's good news to hear that that you see developers being interested in um, in maybe creating a more nuanced view of the history that they're trying to portray because you know looking at the incorporation of non-european um, topics in both crusader kings and in civilization it's it's really heartening on the one hand on the other hand for myself as a medieval islamicist it was also quite disheartening to see how both civilization and um, crusader kings incorporated medieval Islamic um, rulership and kingdoms, but also uh, perpetuated really um, problematic stereotypes and sort of essentialist tropes and so forth. So anyway, just um, just a, a comment that, that it's good to, to know that um, perhaps on both sides, critical, more critical players, but also perhaps developers who are more interested in engaging um, is a good thing. Um, but I was wondering if you could say more about um, the Chapman model uh, and getting beyond the binary that he has presented. Do you have any ideas about that? I'd, I'd be interested to hear. I'm really sorry, Claire. I, I cut out at my end briefly there, but I think talking first about representation, particularly the Islamic world, and then um, about Chapman's Chapman's model. Is that, is that the broad thrust? Yeah, just just a comment that it was it was good to hear that you see some um, some appetite from developers for for being more nuanced. Right. Um, um, no, I, I, yeah, 
No, thank you. Thank you. That, that's good. I, did, I didn't miss as much as I feared. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so what I'd say, um, first of all, you, you do, you've highlighted a really important thing. Uh, this is in particular the decadence mechanic of Crusader Kings 2, where, well, basically, if you, yeah, we don't, we don't, I'm not going to dig into it because it's too depressing too quickly. That has been, and a number, a number of the other more difficult mechanics have been removed in Crusader Kings 3. But just as a follow up on that, it's basically it's, it's a matter of when games do take these more nuanced approaches, in particular when they're being produced by studios studios outside of Europe, then it's important to get behind them. It's important to at least engage with the game, even if it turns out to be a flop. So um, a particular example is the Wagadoon Chronicles, which is combined tabletop and computer RPG that be coming out, I believe, next year, which is a, well, it's primarily Ghanaian developer, um, which I've got, which looks incredible at the moment. So that's that's addressing the. That wasn't even a question, but it was something I wanted to say anyway. Chapman's model. Chapman's model is brilliant. I don't want anyone telling Adam that I've been bad mouthing him, because it's a really useful, really important system. It's rather restrained, though. Or it's rather limited, and in particular, I think this insistence. Well, no, it's not an insistence because he said it's it's meant to be a model. It's meant to be not rigid. It's a tool rather than a rule. But it's led a lot of people to focus on this dichotomy between what games like Assassin's Creed, these vis high, vi highly visual um, games of high visual fidelity. And these games like Civilization, which are much more, more basically calculators with a nice skin over the top of them. And that doesn't work for every game. I think we can see games that are both conceptual and realist. We can see games that are neither. And in particular, role playing games, I don't think they fit on that model particularly well a lot of the time. So yes, you can get games that are role-playing games that are beautifully rendered, things like you know, the Elder Scrolls series, for example, or you can get much more text-heavy, much more number-heavy games. Going say, I don't know, things like Rome or Dwarf Fortress, even. They're still all about role-playing, and that doesn't fit so well. Because I think this is a very different. So Chapman's idea is basically you engage with history either through the visuals and perhaps the story or through the mechanics. And role-playing as a character doesn't fit in with either of those. Well, I like to think, I'm increasingly thinking of it as a triangle. So Chapman's line across the base and role-play up the top and everything can kind of fit in there. However, I'm acutely aware of at least three games which don't fit into that methodology. And I'm also acutely aware that we don't need another system having just spent half an hour saying, Death to systems. Um, does that does that cover it? Does it was there, was there, you know, was there, did you have any anything you wanted? Well, yeah, do you have any suggestions about how Chapman's model could be nuanced or anything? No, thank you. That that was that was interesting to think about um, role playing being brought in as as a third point. Yeah, I was just curious if if the crop of new games that you um, we're talking about had suggested other possibilities for um, for creating a more complex um, framework. But yeah, that's that's perfect. Thank you. I've got a chance putting the camera back on. Um, and just to say, yeah, there's there's plenty of potential more complex frameworks. I'm reluctant to suggest anything that's much more complex, simply because it gets harder to follow very quickly. Um, I think that's the beauty of Chapman's module. Is model. It's just these two nice two neat points, and that's it. So yeah, thank you, man. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. There is um, also a question by Tegwin. Hi. Um. Yeah. So uh, earlier on. Um. It was kind of a slight side comment you made about um audiences finding that their perceptions of history were more affected by games when they were thinking about the kind of middle ages rather than other periods of history um first of all it's a really interesting concept and i i don't think i disagree it's just one i haven't actually come into contact with so i'm interested as to where that comes from 
Um, but secondly, does it, um, how does that, uh, there is a lot of um, stuff about civilization as a representation of the medieval and the middle ages. Um, and your point that actually it doesn't represent the Middle Ages very much. Um, I guess, how does that come about? How does it become something that we're writing scholarly articles about its representation of the Middle Ages when it doesn't really? Um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's fine. And this, yeah, this is right. Um, I'm going you know, to start by blowing my own trumpet. Um, because, yeah, I know, no, I don't know, but I, I strongly suspect, and I've got a couple of articles, or I've run, I've run surveys which strongly suggest that undergraduate students, undergraduate history students at any rate, are influenced more strongly by computer games when those games address historical periods before around 1500. And I think there's various, so I've, I've pushed it a little bit. I'm, there's certainly for the ancient period, for the classical period, there's also a, also a, a there's also evidence of very strong influence here. But it, it works for the purposes of this paper. There's strong evidence that medieval, medievalist games influence their students, sorry, influence their players more strongly than games set in the more modern period. I've got various theories as to why that's the case. Not least is the fact that more recent periods of history tend to be the ones that are taught more frequently in traditional learning materials. I'm going to cut the camera there. Um, so I think there's there is evidence. I'm like, if you if you drop me an email, I can send you links to a couple of articles which which set that out and give give the stats and so forth. And please, please do feel free to tell me I'm absolutely wrong about everything I say in both of those, because as I will say, it's, it's it's perhaps more tenuous than I made out. And with the second point, hopefully, sorry, uh, yeah, hopefully everyone can still hear. So yeah, with the second point. Civilization is I think civilization maybe behind Assassin's Creed has got to be the most commonly written about game in terms of history and there are several very good reasons for this it's in many respects it's the it's the it's the codifier of the historical strategy genre its influence is everywhere and we should absolutely be doing a lot of research about it as this say well as it, well as I said as you said it doesn't necessarily do a particularly good job with the Middle Ages. To be fair though, a lot of games like Civilization don't do a very good job with the Middle Ages. They tend to put it to one side. They tend to keep the mechanics exactly the same as they will be in later periods. And I'm not for a second saying that we should ignore Civilization because it's an important game. It's, I believe it's still the best selling strategy game on the market at the moment. So its reach is vast, but it's not quite as dominant as it was in previous years. And indeed we see a lot of mechanics coming into the more recent iterations of civilization that, is, that originated in other games. So, I think we still need to talk about civilization, but I think there's there's, there's scope to address different games as well. Sorry, that turned into a rant. I apologise. No, no, it makes um, um it makes sense. And I was thinking about um um, um I'll ask a question myself. Uh, in terms of um, just referring to the evolution of um of civilization and of other uh, other games uh, i was wondering about the involvement of uh, academics uh, in the development of these games because if i remember correctly reading uh, several years ago um, in an interview to sid mayer and they asked him so what wh where did you get the history for the for your, your game and he said that uh, he went to uh, a bookshop in uh, in the children's section and he found some uh, uh, history books uh for primary schools i think it was and that is where uh, that was basically the research for the 
uh, civilization one uh, but um, probably today there is more of a involvement of uh, of um, of academics as well i was wondering um, i'm not completely sure about that i know that you were uh, uh, involvement uh, involved at some point um, uh, with uh, with the game companies uh, provide consultancy but i don't know if you are aware of um, basically um, more widely um, about the involvement of academics in uh, uh, especially more recently in these um, developments in these uh, productions Yes, I'm sorry, I was, I was nodding along right the way through that. I realize now the camera's still off, so that doesn't help anybody. Um, you're absolutely let, right. Let's try, let's try again with the, with the camera on. Okay, let's give that a shot. Right. Um, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's not infamous. Yeah, Sid, Sid Meier famously did very little in depth research for any of his games. Um, which perhaps explains some of some of the modern issues with it historians or historical advisors within well historical games of, of any genre um i believe i believe there are a few yeah i believe there are a number of research consultants attached to civilization six although crusader kings free has got numerous people attached and of course assassin's creed trumpets its academic credentials from the roof so there's definitely there's a definite shift in this direction, certainly over what well, over the last 30 years, I suppose, since the original civilization, which is a depressing span of time. Now I stop to think about it. Um, so there is there is this shift. They're perhaps the developers are perhaps asking different questions and after after different things than academics are looking for or feel able to commit to to be able to talk about but the shift is definitely there yeah even if it's well there's, there's certainly a very clear demand for games that have been researched as long as that research ties in with audience expectations are, um, are, are, are academics credited in the titles or in the in the, in the games i mean do they It depends on the game. Um, for Crusader Kings, you can fight off. Well, I'm like, yeah, you can, yeah, again, growing my own probably yeah, self promotion and everything. If you go deep enough into the credits on Crusader Kings 2 and Crusader Kings 3, you will find me listed. It's fairly deep in. Um, I believe it's the same for one of my colleagues over, at, um, over on Assassin's Creed as well. So we do get credited will occasionally be rolled out when it's useful for, for the developers. So uh, Assassin's Creed slivering software, I'm sorry. Yeah, the slivering software with Fields of Glory, they'll, they'll speak to academics. They've, they've made it part of their, their advertising process, basically. They'll run podcasts, they'll get an academic on to talk about battle represented within one of their games, and then they'll play the battle. So there's a lot of kudos, there's a lot of prudential waving going on around these games. Um, and again, perhaps most perhaps most interesting was a number of, of companies who are starting to try and involve academics and historians from the ground up to make games which are hopefully commercially viable, but also which have educational and even even research potential. So it's very early days with this. Um, if you're interested in any projects like this, it's Wan Hiriat down at um, the University of Sheffield, not University of Sheffield, Sunderland it is, sorry, um, has, is, is involved in a number of these projects, mainly around the Napoleonic era, but they're making historical games for heritage purposes, mm -hmm. but also with commercial bent to it. And one Wan's brilliant, he's, he's He's from Chile, which is by the by, but he's, he's got a program background alongside an emerging historical interest. There's nothing I've been aware I'm aware of that's been a major commercial hit off this sort of approach. But to be fair, this is very early years. There's very few things that are in a position to be released. So it's definitely something to look out for in the next five, ten years or so, I hope. Perfect, thank you. Any more any more questions? 
I, I think the glitches Perfect. between uh, matching the audio and the vid uh, video show we're still in the very uh, lower slopes of artificial intelligence really uh, that's going to be useful for the emergence of these several streams um, of handling multifactorial uh, situations uh, in the future. And so um, I think it would be nice uh, also to just hear a little of the improvements that happened in the later uh, Civ 6. You know, are they going the right direction by uh, how they're handling uh, city states and things like this? Um, uh, and most of the um, use of the examples from the early civilization will soon become uh, very much like ancient history itself, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a, a very valid point, Gordon. Uh, it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, yeah, the civilization games, they've become more complex over the years, and Civ Six in particular is doing some doing some very interesting things. Um, what do I like about recent Civilization games? Right, so Civilization VI, to a certain extent Civilization V, there's more differentiation between different civilizations. The civilizations have their own, their own well, they've, always, they've had their own traits since Civilization III, but they, they've been set up such that different civilizations now play in very different in a very different manner. That's great from a gameplay perspective. It's also potentially, and I'm emphasizing this, potentially useful for looking at different cultural issues across different civilizations. The difficulty comes in the fact that these traits are static, that they're set up as this thing that's very very much it's, it's, you know, it's embedded within the identity of the, a, a given civilization. So the French will always be cultural, the Koreans will always be scientific, and there's very little you can do to change that. That's an issue that the difficulty. It's something that works if we're looking at a game of a shorter time period, but to say 6,000 years, we're going to define this this culture as this one thing is, is more of an issue. Um, I like the introduction of, of city-states, I like the introduction of a greater range of civilizations. I'm also gently hopeful at the support for modding that seems to be coming in. So this wasn't available at release. It's something that I'm always keen to see, but I, I, I suspect, well, I'm very much of the opinion that most of the best historical games are mods. They're things that aren't quite what the developer intended or what the developer was able to put out, but they give us the opportunity to change things around, to change the rules and then change the arguments and so forth. So yeah, there, there are various good points to Civilization VI. Um, still very far off what I would like it to be, but it's going in the right direction, albeit fairly slowly. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. And um, <clears throat> just a uh, one thing because I see, uh, I see uh, the time is almost up. Um, a few years ago, I saw that there was a discussion about an educational version of uh, uh, civilization, civilization, but that didn't uh, actually come to be. I don't know if you heard about it and uh, if you know why, what happened to it, or if they simply, you know, um, simply no. didn't work. I, I suspect I, I suspect I know exactly as much as you do about this, Luca, because there were, there were a series of articles teasing this using yeah, civilization. Or, um, is it Fire Axis? I think it was Fire Axis at that point. Um, we're going to release this variant for, for educational purposes. I don't know what happened with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it was sunk because it wasn't commercially viable, because it was too much of a, it required too much too much change into a fundamental game engine. Um, it's, I, I rather suspect it was simply a change somewhere fairly high up the management system resulted in the project being canned. They pulled the plug, yes. Yeah, I suspect, um, which, is, which is a great shame. But at the same time, there's all these examples. Um, 
Lord Hager in particular springs to mind of using civilization in the classroom. So getting students to play it and play it critically. So recognizing that it's not, it's not a, it's not an academic vision of history, but it is a vision of history. And students basically sending them off with the exact same tools they'd use to dissect an academic source, sending them off to play the game and dissect its rules, dissect the arguments they represent and so forth. And it is Ortega, yeah, he's got the, he takes it to the next step as well. Um, and has, he has the students mod, I believe it was Civilization 3, go into the files, change the rules to better reflect their understanding of history or to create an individual scenario. And I think in many respects, that's the most powerful use of games for teaching purposes. It's not, it's not necessarily playing them, it's making them. It's pulling the rules to pieces and creating a more nuanced representation of the past through them. And to be fair, that's something that I don't think was ever going to be greenlit from, from civilization, regrettably. Thank you. Um, any other question? Uh, uh, I did uh, have one so it's an, an final question of what, of, um, so going off what uh, Glare, uh, Glare had to say about uh, the depiction of uh, Islamic rulership in uh, Crusader Kings 2, and I must confess that Crusader Kings 2 uh, had the same effect on me while in my undergraduate years as uh, it seems <laughs> the early civilization games had on Gianluca. I was up till very late at night in my <laughs> student uh, accommodation playing that game. But uh, you were saying about how the decadence mechanic, and I do wonder, I feel like in a lot of popular culture in the West, there's not a lot of, I feel there's not a lot of nuanced depictions of Islamic civilization or history. Everyone seems very keen to either lionize or condemn it, like show it as very good or very bad. It would be, I, I would be very interested like if, if perhaps the, the, these talks may, might have, you know, go, go in deeper with that, uh, on that topic about, well, nuanced depictions of Middle Eastern and Islamic culture. Is a, is, is a, is a very good uh, um, idea for, uh, for a separate seminar, seminar in which yeah. we, um, a, a examine the, uh, the, the, the portrayal of, uh, yes, of that in, uh, in games. Uh, absolutely. Um, look, so, well, I, I, I suspect you've already got fairly far into the read, or into your reading around this, but um, Bit, Bit Sisler, um, is a Czech author or Czech historian, um, who also works on representation in games, has got a huge tranche of work relating to representations of Islam and Arabs in particular within more modern games. Um, perhaps a tendency towards the more modern materials, but certain, certainly relevant to the Middle Ages. Um, if, yeah, Luca, if you, if you can secure him as a speaker, that would be, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> oh, sorry, Luca. Perfect. Sorry, well, I muted myself. Um, perfect. I am aware of the time, and um, um, I want to. I wish to thank uh, thank Rob for uh, for the splendid uh, uh, paper, and I look forward to post it on uh, on our YouTube channel uh, uh, as well. Uh, I take also the opportunity to advertise the next seminar, which will take place on the twenty fifth of March. And we will have a uh, professor John Buckley from the University of Wolverhampton. Um, you might have seen his book uh, recently in bookshops. Uh, it, it was uh, um, quite a bestseller in uh, for uh, around Christmas. The Armchair General: Can You Defeat the Nazis? Um, the title of the seminar uh, follows the title of the book, but also it is about the genesis, the reception. An impact of an historical game book. So this is a um, um, multi-option uh, uh, historical book published by published by Penguin. So we will look at the genre of uh, uh, of historical game books at the end of March, and I will advertise that to our mailing list because the list basically we will organize it together with Blackwell's Bookshop in uh, uh, Southbridge in Edinburgh. Uh, so we will advertise it soon on Eventbrite as well. Perfect. I look forward to see you there, uh, and uh, thank you again, uh, uh, Rob, for uh, for your for your paper. Uh, I look forward to catch up.
thank you and thank you all for bearing with me with the connection difficulties. Thank you from Jacqueline you. and myself. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Jacqueline. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.